How's it going, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Diabetes Survival Guide Show. Today, I'm joined by the wonderful Shannon Curtis. So Shannon has been a monumental dietitian in the uh, dialysis and the renal fields. And with people with type 2 diabetes, it's commonly known that they may develop uh, kidney disease, or in my grandfather's case, when he passed away from type 2 diabetes, being put on dialysis from kidney failure and ultimately passing away from kidney failure. Working with renal dietitians have a huge and special place in my heart. And additionally, Shannon has been very involved with improving accessibility and awareness for dietitians, especially those of color inside the healthcare field and the space. And she's recently starting a new virtual private practice called the Sweet Life Nutrition and Fitness, where she's wanting to expand to not just focusing on the nutritional aspect, but let's also figure out what is the fitness component? How is everyone's physical health doing? Because nutrition, physical fitness, that lifestyle component, they all fit together comprehensively. And it's better to make sure that we focus on hitting all those domains to make sure someone improves their health in a holistic manner, instead of only relying on one thing, which can only get us so far. So without further ado, I am here to welcome Shannon. And Shannon, please share uh, more about your story. Tell us about yourself and uh, what got you involved working with people with diabetes and working with uh, people with renal conditions specifically and the stuff that I haven't covered. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for having me on the show. Mm -hmm. So a little bit about myself. I've been a dietitian for a little over four years now. I have been working in the Houston metro area this whole time as a dietitian. Prior to that, dietetic internship in Shreveport, Louisiana with Louisiana Tech University, a number of rotations. It wasn't just clinical or just food service. I also had a renal rotation, had a community rotation. So there were a lot of different areas that I got to see during that time. I did have a one to two week diabetes rotation during that time at the VA up there in Shreveport. And I really enjoyed it. And I thought, okay, like, Diabetes education could be my thing, but really I just knew that I wanted to go into clinical. So I started out as an outpatient dietitian for a large hospital system for their outpatient clinics and rotated around there. And in those outpatient clinics, I mostly got patients that were dealing with diabetes or weight management. Those were the most referrals. We have so many diabetes referrals that we actually, in addition to the general nutrition classes, we ran diabetes nutrition classes as well. So it was really cool to be able to help with that curriculum and teach those classes. I really, honestly, I enjoy teaching those diabetes classes, teaching people how to manage their carbohydrates and things like that. But as I got more involved in that, so this was 2020 when I started my career as a dietitian. We all know what happened in 2020. COVID year. Oof. Oh, so we all know what happened in 2020, not only with COVID, but also the dawn of everybody paying a little bit more attention to diversity, equity, and inclusion, which included paying attention to how we treat our patients of color. And so with that, I started to delve a bit more into how people's cultural norms and foods could play a role in our diabetes management and also really seeing the effects of what we had done so far prior to 2020 with the demonization of foods and really promoting like one way of eating, what it's done to my patients of color. When we finally went back in person, I did have patients, once they saw me, especially if they were Black, they got really excited. They were relieved, excited. They're like, oh, this appointment not be so bad after all. Unfortunately, when we were virtual, they couldn't see me. That wasn't the case. We did have video visits, but honestly, the system was wonky. Like it didn't really work out. So for all intents and purposes, they didn't know that I was Black or a person of color. I remember very specifically a Korean patient of mine, her daughter called me and said she really needs to see a dietitian, but because her doctor and other dietitians have told her she can't eat rice, like she doesn't want to see anybody. Just really experiencing things like that and really trying to break down that barrier, that wall of resistance that a lot of people have now and justifiably they hadn't had a good experience in the past and 
were dismissed and weren't really listened to about their individual needs. But yeah, so I, I did a lot of diabetes education during my time as an outpatient dietitian. And then I shifted over to renal dialysis in 2022, naively thinking, okay, I'm mostly just going to work or talk about the kidney diet or the renal diet and not realizing at the time, oh, the leading cause of kidney failure is diabetes. So you're still going to deal a lot with diabetes education, diabetes management, things like that, which is great because I, I love working with diabetes. I'm literally building a private practice in diabetes management. Really been enjoying a renal dialysis and really getting to see that other side of diabetes management, like the long-term effects, what could happen in the case of somebody not really taking the precautions early on in their diabetes management, what it could lead to, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's where I'm at now, uh, working in renal dialysis. Uh, wow. It, yeah, it's fun. It's busy. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that, especially with the story of your uh, patient or client who was trying to figure out, I can't have rice by so many other providers to then learning, no, you can't have it. It's just, we got to be smart about how we have it and incorporate it into it. Mm -hmm. And then- the journey that you've had of, all right, doing a lot for diabetes education and working with that community to then moving on to working in uh, the kidney care field to then learning, oh, diabetes is a leading cause for kidney failure. And for those who don't know, diabetes is also the leading cause for uh, adult blindness. And it's also the leading cause for preventable amputations. And it's also the leading cause for about every other thing that is going on, even for stroke, heart attack, all those yeah. other conditions that are out there. It's all preventable by addressing the type 2 diabetes and prediabetes. And unfortunately, that doesn't get talked about in the 15 minute visit with someone's primary care provider. And it just gets brushed away of, oh, you just need to do this instead of taking a step further to ask, well, what's your background? What's your cultural background? And as Shannon has mentioned, it has such a huge impact when someone can see someone who looks like them, who can understand their culture, because it's not going to be met with, all right, we're just going to reject whatever past life that someone has had only to forcibly fit into this narrow box that we have for what we think is supposed to be the right part of care, when in reality, it's probably outdated, or it's not taking into consideration of the other research articles that are printed in different languages that people just don't see in their radar. So it's not like a only the Western diet and that's it. It's no, we got to understand that people will decide what they want to do. So instead of calling people as, oh, you're bad for doing this, it's no, it's okay that you want to have this. Let's figure out how we can balance that in what you're wanting. And that's like speaks volume to who you are, Shannon. And thank you so much for sharing that. <laughs> yeah. So I'm curious now, like what parts about diabetes education do you consider fun? What makes it fun to you? I think of carb counting. There's different ways of doing it. Uh, I think of carb counting as like a puzzle piece. Mm -hmm. I think it's a game almost, honestly. And I'm very science brained. Uh, so when I get a hold of information, 15 grams of carbs can raise your blood sugars by X amount of points in your blood sugar. Like I, I get really nerdy with it. And I'm, I'm like, this is really cool. Just the relation of it in the body and like the different types of carbohydrates, whether it's a simple sugar or what we consider like a complex carbohydrate, which realistically is just something higher in fiber and how all of that plays a role. And personally, I just love carbs. Like I love potatoes. I love rice. I love sugar too. And I just think it's considered our most essential like macronutrient. Like we need the most of that particular macronutrient in our diet. It provides energy and fuel, not only for the body, but also the brain. So it's always going to get talked about. And unfortunately, on the other hand, it always gets demonized. So it's like, how do we combat this? How do we navigate nutrition education about diabetes and carbohydrates in a world that is really hell bent on just saying carbs are bad, don't eat carbs, don't eat sugar. And there, there is some validity to that high sugar intake, like actual sugar from soda or candy and things like that over a long period of time can cause some damaging effects on your cells and obviously can put you at higher risk of some of these chronic diseases. And that 
continues to need to be talked about, but we need to incorporate some kind of balance. And I personally, I love talking to people about carbohydrates and sugar, people with diabetes and giving them ways to manage it in moderation and kind of seeing their faces light up like, oh, I can have beans. I can have rice. I can have spaghetti. Their favorite foods, because let's be real, carbohydrates are the main macronutrient of most of our favorite foods in a Western diet, even in other cultural diets that are not Western. Hmm. So I just think it's really cool, not only from the science base of it, but also just people standpoint. Uh, It's like plain deducted to figure out where do these puzzle pieces fit together and what's the rationale for why the blood sugar rises this much after eating this amount? And then what other influences, like how does fiber play an influence for how the blood sugar spikes? And then also understanding now that we can understand those relationships, how can we be smart with the other parts of the puzzles so that people can feel empowered to be in control of their health again and being able to incorporate the things that they want. So I love to hear that. (laughs) And then I think there was this awesome study that came out and it was talking about the consumption of like carbohydrates, the prevalence of obesity rate, and also the prevalence of like type two diabetes. And in the US for the past 30 years, it shows that there's a decrease in carbohydrate intake, but there's still a rise in obesity rates and in type two diabetes rates. So it's like that goes to show that if that's still rising, but carbohydrate intake is decreasing, I think it's not a carbohydrates issue. And as I tell a lot of people with type two diabetes, like it's more insulin resistance, where the issue isn't the blood sugar spikes, the issue is the blood sugar spikes are not coming back down because the sugars aren't moving back into the muscles in the brain to be used as fuel. So that's the issue. It's not what's coming in, it's how it's being used. That's the issue. Yes. And that is something that I try to educate my patients on all the time. I'm like, diabetes is not, it's not a glucose. It's not a sugar issue. It's not a carb issue. It's an insulin issue. Mm -hmm. You either don't have enough insulin or your insulin is not working efficiently enough. So Mm -hmm. what can we do to one, get around these deficiencies in the way the insulin works and two, to some degree, make the insulin work a little bit better in your favor. That's the thing that we need to address. And once the patient or the client starts understanding that, Mm -hmm. it can approach the food in a much less scary (laughs) (laughs) manner. Because people, to be fair, like people are legitimately scared of carbs. Like they're scared of food. They're Mm -hmm. scared to eat. I've had patients come to me and say, I haven't been eating at all because I feel like I can't eat anything because again, a lot of the Western diet and even cultural diets are heavy in carbohydrates. And I'm like, okay, we have to address the eating first. At that point, I can't even go over carbohydrates and insulin and all the other stuff. What can we just get you to start eating again? Mm -hmm. Um, But because of the way just society has created the narrative around food and especially around carbs and different other types of foods, it's hard to get people to hear that and see that if a patient comes to you and they're expecting you to say certain things, and then you don't say those certain things. So then they still, they write you off or they say, oh, she's not telling me to reduce my calories to X amount, or she's not telling me to cut out these foods. And so this must not work. It's hard to gain the trust of people that have been listening to the magazines and the social media and the influencers and people who haven't even gone to school for this stuff, (laughs) talk about it all the time Mm -hmm. um, under the guise of trying to improve health. And it's an oxymoron because this whole time it's been about health, but then the health is still declining. Like you said, so crazy. (laughs) We think this is the issue, but then all of a sudden, how come these things are still not getting better if we think that this cause is being addressed? (laughs) Oh, crazy. And I also want to like highlight too that the fear is real because whenever I'm posting in social media of, hey, like carbs aren't the enemy, it's the insulin resistance that's the enemy. It's also the fear mongering that could be developing an eating disorder or disordered eating habits, especially with orthorexia, where so pe- many people are fixated on crap. I have to make sure that I'm eating organically, that I have all these. 50 different supplements, and then I have to do these things, and I have to make sure that my water is clean, and it just adds these unnecessary stressors. 
And considering if someone is in not a good financial situation and they're being told, well, the reason why they're stuck in that situation is because they're choosing to have the frozen vegetables, which that's been disproven. That's been proven to show that frozen veggies are just as nutrient packed as the fresh ones, or even more because it's frozen at the peak freshness and like canned goods too. So it's like addressing those issues. And I posted on my social media and it's unfortunate that despite providing some of those sources on there, my posts are getting reported as spam or as false information. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I'm just like, okay, so people are able to start posting their information that's outdated or they're not citing their sources or rationale or reasoning. But for me, where I am citing those sources and my posts are being blocked because of that, I'm like, this is a major issue over here. Not only, and whenever I ask people, hey, where's your sources to prove this? Because, and then be inserting the different citations that disproves what the person is saying and it just gets blocked or it's like oh this is rude or this is harassing or oh this isn't going to be taken i'm just like i'm just presenting the facts like why am i getting punished for letting people know that what they're talking about isn't up to date for things That is <laughs> crazy. I did yeah not know that. That is insane. yeah uh -huh. like i went on facebook the other day and i just received a bunch of notifications saying hey your post was removed because it violated these rules. And I looked at these rules as, oh, there's a file for harassment. There's a file for false information. There's a file for like false health information. I'm just like, what do you mean? <laughs> there's all these different ones. And then yet people are still posting these other outdated informations. Like, for example, the other one that I saw was the post on, oh, if an ingredient label has a lot of ingredients that you cannot pronounce or it's a super long list that it's bad for you compared to something that has less amount of ingredients or has more of the ingredients that someone can pronounce and i was like that doesn't necessarily mean it's that's the case <laughs> so Exactly. yeah That's it's crazy in my opinion yeah <laughs> wow. I I did not know that. Yeah, it's I don't recommend it for anyone in those situations, but I would say social media platforms, please do better because there's a huge looming health crisis that's already becoming to show because of the information that people should have access to is being blocked. And the information, the misinformation is not getting held for like accountable for, which is aggravating, in my opinion. Yeah, no, and it is very aggravating. That's why us as dietitians and just health professionals in general, we have to be very mindful of what we allow in our algorithm on the social media feeds because Mm hmm just scrolling on there for five minutes, it can be so triggering to see some of the stuff that shows up on there mm hmm or maybe something shows up that we agree with and reading the comments can be very triggering. And it's mm like, hmm why are, why are people like this? That's, yeah mm hmm yeah. oh my goodness but it's the struggle that we choose to get up every day and combat that so that we can save at least one more life <laughs> oh goodness All right, Shannon, the next question that I want to ask, uh, especially with your efforts in improving diversity, equity, and inclusion, and representing people of color. So what inspired you to run and serve as the diversity chair for the Texas Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics? Yeah, so it's funny because that role just fell in my lap. Yeah, Um, of when course I it came, did. That's how all yeah, positions happen. <laughs> when I came back to Texas and was about to take my RD exam and start my career as a dietitian, I was like, okay, I want to seriously serve in the academy. And I was already really good friends with some people that were spearheading leadership in our regional, our Southeast region academy. So I I texted her and I said, hey, if you've got a spot on the regional committee, I would love to serve. And it just so happened that they were looking for new diversity coordinators for each region. So she was like, hey, this is the only spot that's open. We're looking for diversity coordinators. Like, we think you'd be really good for that role. And it's funny because my sole reason that I wanted to enter leadership was to eventually do diversity efforts. So it was really nice that I just could enter that role immediately instead of having to shift gears like once I got my foot in the door. Mm hmm So yeah to speak. mm hmm Um, so yeah, I served as diversity coordinator for the Southeast region, which is the Houston, Galveston, and Beaumont area. It also includes like Waco and College Station, I think. That whole area down here, whoever's familiar with Texas, was the area that I served as diversity coordinator. 
And then with that, I was on the diversity committee for the state. There was a different diversity chair at the time. And we worked together, putting together a survey for the state. We applied for a diversity grant from the National Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. We're, we were awarded that grant. And then when she decided to step down from diversity chair, she passed it on to me. So that's how I got <laughs> that. And again, that was at a time that was during the 2020 time. So that was a time when the George Floyd incident happened. And then after that, everybody was wanting to include more diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts in their organizational practices or whatever. And not only did the role in diversity fall in my lap, but then a lot of speaking engagements fell in my lap too, because they wanted to hear somebody speak about diversity and inclusion and how we could improve that specifically for the dietetics field. What are what are the problems and what do we need to do to solve the problems? There was a lot of other stuff going on the national level as well. So I gained a lot of colleagues in the, pro uh, in the process as well. A lot of colleagues uh, from across the country who I consider very monumental just in the nutrition space and with the academy in their own right. And these women have been serving like way longer than me because I, I was a newbie at the time and they had already been serving for years, five, six, seven years in the space. So that was really cool to be able to connect with some of these more well-known dietitians that we see in the space these dietitian rock stars, able to connect with them and network th with them and eventually just form friendships with them. I think that was like a really rewarding piece of it. But yeah, again, so a lot of those speaking engagements and, and things fell in my lap because they wanted somebody to speak and they didn't want to see somebody white speaking about it. That's really what it was. And they saw me, I had already had a title of diversity chair, diversity coordinator. So they were like, oh, hey, can you come speak? I've spoken not only like to the state and different schools around the state, but I also spoke to a group out in California, a group out in Washington for their state academies as well. Virtually, of course, I also spoke to a school out in Illinois. So yeah, very far reaching. And it just, it was a roller coaster ride. It was a, it's a fun ride. And I'm actually speaking soon. I'm not sure when this podcast will be aired, but for any dietitian that lives in Texas listening to this before April 5th, our state conference is coming up and I will be on a panel speaking about some diversity issues and that'll be in a couple of weeks. So <laughs> yeah, hopefully this will be aired before that happens. But if not, is there an on demand for that? <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think so. But, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not sure. I want to say... For, so for the state conferences, I think it's just harder to get the equipment and the funding necessary to do hybrid conferences. Mm -hmm. So they just switch back to totally in person. But if there is, if I'm wrong and there is, I will definitely let you know. <laughs> Sounds like a good time. <laughs> yeah. So when you did uh, get that position and connected with the other mentors, what would you say has been the most monumental feedback that you received from them? that helped better clarify the direction you wanted to head and what you wanted to do with the position? Most monumental feedback. That's a really good question. <laughs> I ask great questions out here. <laughs> I would say, I think the thing that I learned the most from them is that you do what you can, but take care of yourself. Because as a lot of people who have worked with the Academy, like on more a national level, or have dealt with the academy in any sort of way, already know that our wants and needs don't always get listened to the extent that we would want them to. There are still complaints to this day, four years later, after we created a petition and got all these signatures and this and that, and asking national organization to do more for our community of dietitians to help this issue of diversity and less black and brown people applying or wanting to become dietitians. After all that's been said, there's still issues, there's still complaints. Depending on who you talk to, they would say, we're still not being heard. 
And there, it does get to a point where you have to say, okay, I've done the work. I've came and spoke at your organizations. I've told you what the problems was. I put my story out there. I told you what the solutions were. Now it's time to put in work and it's, you can only do so much. So I think that's what I learned from a lot of those colleagues, being passionate and keep doing the work, but also know when to pull back and say, hey, I've gone as far as I can go at this point. Doesn't mean I'm completely stepping out of it, but maybe I just need to step back, take a break. (laughs) And then maybe revisit this at a different time, which Mm -hmm. I think I, I personally did that because I went full force 2020 to 2023. I started as diversity coordinator. I went to diversity chair while still serving as diversity coordinator and and then got elected as director elect and eventually served as director of the whole region while still serving for the state and then still serving for some of what we call the dietetic practice groups on the national level. And I burnt out and it's not that I don't want to go back to academy leadership in national organization leadership, but I just needed a break to say, okay, I just want to be a dietitian. I just want to be a dietitian. I want to focus on more subject matter things. I want to focus on chronic diseases. I want to be known for more than just the diversity girl, for lack of a better phrase. And I think I've done a good job of that. Now I'm starting my private practice and diabetes and fitness. I'm starting to get back into the personal training aspect of things renal dietitian, plan on really honing my expertise in that field as well. And still keeping in mind like structural and cultural competency within all that, there will always be a space for that. So yeah, but I I just had to step back and say, okay, somebody else handle it, please. For just a few months, I'll come (laughs) back. I'll never leave the space, but yeah, knowing when to pull back. Mm -hmm. Basically staying in there and then it is definitely frustrating when you put in all this effort to say, hey, you asked for this, I gave you this, here's the solutions, I went above and beyond, only to be met with, yeah, we're not going to listen to that right now. And then doing that over and over for the three years now, and a little bit of change, like, I can definitely understand that taking a bit of time to focus on building the other things that you want to build for your impact that you want to make in this world, that it's good to make sure that one candle if it does burn out, to still focus on pouring the energy and fuel onto the other candles that can uh, be built and is ready for that spark until that one is ready to receive it again. Exactly. And Mm -hmm. for some of my colleagues that, again, had been serving in these different committees and groups for years before I even entered the space, I saw the mental health toll that it took on some of them. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I even had colleagues that started to help me with a different initiative or a certain thing and then had to step down and say, this is too much because it, it does get exhausting, especially. And I think that's one thing that a lot of people, the white people underestimate about being a person of color is just like the mental toll that it takes on you to just be black in a certain space every day or to be Hispanic in a certain space every day, or whatever your cultural identity is, or whatever your identity is, right? And the racism and the microaggressions and the discrimination that may or may not come with that, Mm -hmm. it's exhausting. And then you still have to be something for these very vulnerable patients and clients that are, are seeking your help. And for me, I work in a space where my patients, they, they don't have money. A lot of them are homeless they've got way bigger fish to fry than whatever we're always talking about. (laughs) They're just trying to get to the next day in some cases. And then you come to them as a healthcare provider trying to help them. They're going to lean on you and you need to have energy for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's enough energy trying to deal with that and also realizing the role that racism and discrimination plays in even their position And then also have to deal with your own stuff on your level. Like, it's just too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Making sure that we still have some left in the tank to maintain our sanity. (laughs) Exactly. Oh, so good. All right. 
The next question that I want to ask is what's been your best success story with a client that you've worked with? Change into more clinical side. <laughs> yeah, I think I would have to say, uh, so there's a couple of them. So, and these are from my, my outpatient job that I had prior to working in renal dialysis. There's one lady. So to give background, you know, when you, you know that you know what you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Because patients or clients don't follow the information, you start to doubt yourself. And you're like, it's, and what I is what I'm saying, is it valid? Is it not working? What's going on? So I've had that moment of where I was validated in my methods of teaching diabetes care to this one particular client. She did struggle at times, maybe taking her medications or eating the quote unquote right way. But she, we had an appointment one day and she told me, she said, this moderation thing, it really works. And I said, oh my gosh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's about time. I, I needed this so win. <laughs> validated in that moment because I was like, okay, these things that I have been screaming about this whole time, like it's not a farce, right? Like it's real, it works. But yeah, she told me, she said, this moderation thing really works. She said, I, I don't feel like I'm restricting. She said, I'm managing my blood sugars. I said, oh my gosh, we have seen the light. So that was really rewarding. I had another patient. She was a really good patient, admittedly. She had gotten to a point where we didn't even need appointments anymore, or at least not as often as one month. She was a, she was going on a camping trip and she was able to prepare and set herself up with all her medications, her snacks, all of that to where, cause she was going to some remote location. She knew she wasn't going to have access to like grocery stores and things like that. And she did really well. She did really well. She kept her A1C under six, even throughout that time of being away. And I was able to, to help with that. I was able to help with the different things and methods that I taught her and be an accountability for her in a way. And I said, congratulations, you're, you're doing it. Mm -hmm. You are what we call a success. I know the ADA guidelines for people with diabetes is have A1C under seven. She had an A1C under six. I'm like that. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So happy to hear about that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, it reminds me of the time where I had the, I'm also working with a client right now and they have a lot of other conditions that makes it a bit difficult for them to get their blood sugars more into ranges. However, when they were able to start reintroducing carbohydrates back into their routine again, and they are able to have their favorite candies without feeling as guilty about it. And their blood sugars are like not where they want to be like perfectly. I had to bring her down and just say, Hey, this is heads up. Having blood sugars at 95, two hours after meals every single time. I don't think that's realistic. If it's a, like when you wake up in a fastest state, like that's definitely more realistic, but just having a, let's actually sit down and be realistic here and understand more of the science and being realistic about it and celebrating the wins for the habits that she has. And for the points where it is, it seems like not a whole lot of progress is being made, but then we're steadily making progress. And then I'm just like, man, I'd really like it if I could just, if I could also have worked with other people where it's just a, they just incorporate this thing and all of a sudden it gets a lot better and have a good cascading effect instead of being met with some people who they're doing the hardest that they can and they are making those changes but it's still not what they want it to be i'm just like okay i still have love for those people but i also want to have some of them where it doesn't take as much mental space and energy because if the stuff that i'm sharing with them that they're doing isn't quite working like that doubt becomes real because it's like man is what i'm like preaching and talking about is this really it because I'm hitting a huge crossroads with this. I've talked with other colleagues to see what else I could do differently, but the progress just isn't as fast as what we both want it to be. And it just reminds me of the time when I was in a clinical rotation where my clinical instructor was saying, hey, I understand that you're frustrated when you're working with these patients who have more complex conditions or situations. And sometimes it's always good to have that simple one that comes in once in a while, just to help more with that maintaining your energy level, because always working with someone who drains a lot of that mental energy and capacity, which isn't a bad thing. It's like trying to see how we can conserve it all together appropriately, where we still have more to give for the rest of the day and also making sure that we're functional ourselves. So we're recovered 
and can help with that next case load for the next day that making sure that we're good about it, it is helpful to have that break once in a while. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. No, I, mm -hmm. Everything you just said, yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's man, I thought I had this magic touchdown, but apparently not quite there yet. <laughs> and when you do have that moment where just, man, I'm on fire and I'm great at this. Uh it yeah. it comes in waves. <laughs> exactly. We just have to remember people are gonna be people. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's one thing that I've just had to learn over the years. Like you can bring a horse to water, but you can't necessarily make them drink. So with that being said, you can give them all the handouts, all the information you could almost even do it for them if they don't if they're not there they're just not there yep i think the troublesome part is they are there and they are doing their best it's it's that the body just isn't showing the results that we're both wanting because i'm seeing the journals that they show me here's my journal here's these stuff and i'm like i can tell you're putting in the work and i can understand this but we just got to be patient because it's little by little until we have more of that breakthrough moment <laughs> Yeah. And I totally get it too for doing our best for those who maybe just aren't ready for it and just leave the door open until they are. <laughs> All right, Shannon. So the other question I had for you is what has been the hardest lesson that you've learned since starting your journey of uh, becoming a dietitian, starting your own practice all along those lines? And what did you learn from that? So I think the hardest lesson I've learned and this has to do more so with just working in healthcare is that at the end of the day, it's all about the metrics and the money. If you are not working for yourself, right? If you're working for a healthcare institution, a hospital, anybody who is not yourself, or maybe a group of like-minded colleagues opening their own clinic or deal, Nothing else matters if the numbers don't make sense to them. And unfortunately for us as healthcare providers, we're the ones doing the work, going out in the field every day, catching all the backlash, just dealing with everything. They're sitting in their offices or at their computer looking at spreadsheets, looking at metrics. And yes, metrics are needed financial targets and goals, all that is needed, but it's a very unfortunate part of healthcare because it really ties your hands on what you can and can't do. And then it burns you out, like how we've been talking about earlier. It really burns you out. And I think that's just been my biggest issue, no matter where I work, because I complained about it at my last job, but it was my first job. So I didn't... I. I knew that all healthcare institutions were like that, but I didn't know if it would get better or worse at the next place I worked at. Mm -hmm. e everywhere is the same. Like they want to see, I, I think the biggest fight at my outpatient job was we want you to have nine slots open a day for appointments. And all of us on the team trying to get upper management to understand like, hey, yes, these are 30 minute slots, but Sometimes the patient needs more than 30 minutes. Sometimes they need 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. In rare cases, they need an hour. That pushes everyone else back. That pushes me back. That makes my lunch hour to 15 minutes instead mm -hmm. of the hour that I originally had. There are so many side effects that snowball as a result of just pushing to have all these appointments. And especially like when I was doing virtual full-time because we weren't back in the clinics yet in person, they wanted us to have 10, 11 spots open oh. a day and having to talk to person after person, it just got really exhausting and learning. And this is also ingrained just in corporate culture in general, like them saying, oh, we got your back. Oh, we're a family. This no, you don't. You don't. Let's be real. Because <laughs> if you did... You would hire more dietitians. You would split up our workloads. You would make sure that we were taken care of, not only with our schedules, but also mentally, physiologically, like whatever. So yeah, that, that was the hardest thing to learn, really. And I think that's why I really appreciate the entrepreneurship side, because once I get to that point of having a regular clientele and things like that, like I work for myself. I can set my own schedule. I, as a person who wants to see me succeed and cares about 
my well-being and not going to overload myself with all this work to do to the point where I'm pulling my hair out while I was working for somebody else in the healthcare space. That's not so much the case. And we see it in our space, but then we really see it with the nurses. They're always burnt out. I also worked for a long-term acute care facility for about three years mm. while I was working the outpatient job. And it was hard to just even have conversations with them sometimes. They would be really snappy or just really agitated or really tired. And understandably, they had just worked a 16-hour shift, a 12-hour shift, or whatever the shifts were. It was a lot of hours on their feet, having to deal with patients and their different states and things like that. I just, learning that, again, if the money doesn't make sense, nobody's really going to listen to you complain about it. It's a frustrating feeling. And I think this can resonate even more so with dietitians because a big issue is the issue of pay. Dietitians not getting paid enough, especially in clinical spaces. And part of that is the reimbursement rates. Hospitals and healthcare institutions are not getting reimbursed for nutrition services at the rate that they are just for PCPs and maybe physician assistants and other people in the healthcare field. So they then they base our pay off of that. It's a very unfortunate situation. So you see dietitians starting out at 45, 50, maybe $55,000 a year. And 55 is generous, might I add. <laughs> starting out at $55,000 a year and cannot even get a 2% raise at the end of their first year working. And it all has to do because the hospital's not getting reimbursed. And it's like, what else do we have to do to prove our, our value, to prove our worth in the healthcare space? And I think it, I'd say it is getting better, but I, I say we still have a long way to go. So yeah, that's been the hardest lesson. Just again, you have to do what you can with what you have. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have, I don't know, an iPad or something, you feel like you need an iPad to run your classes because you want people to be able to pass it around and see different things. If the metrics and the money doesn't make sense, nobody's going to give you that iPad. At my current job, there is a need for in-person interpreter services. So me being newer to the team, I went, I ran all the numbers for it. And they looked at me and they said, this is not going to happen. And yeah, like about half of my clinic is Spanish speaking. Mm. Again, that's just one of the unfortunate things. If the money doesn't make sense. I'm not going to say they don't care, but very seemingly they don't care what effect it has on patient outcomes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The brutal tragedy tragedies with outpatient settings or just even other patient settings, in my opinion, too, because yeah. the hardships of, hey, let's look at how much money we're getting back. And then if it isn't making margins, then absolutely nothing. If we're barely making margins or we're slightly above it, then it's we can't do anything because we got to try and account for inflation for the next year. And then that just stuff just keeps on compounding. And it's how come that the loans that I took out for school is already like at this percent, it's 8% now for me. And then if people aren't getting that 2% raise to even combat what inflation is doing and what the student loan interest rate is, that it's this isn't financially feasible at this point. And I'm so, sure the same situation too for dietitians, just from the conversations I've had with other people. Ugh. Yeah, and it's unfortunate because I think of being in healthcare very similar to teaching. Mm -hmm. You care so much. You want to do so much, but you can only do so much because you don't have the resources. Mm -hmm. And it's not for a lack of the money being there. It's just that the people who have the money don't want to give it to you. It's very unfortunate. Mm -hmm. And then now we have a nursing shortage. Now we have a dietitian shortage. I mean, shortage for everything, unfortunately. <laughs> exactly. There's a shortage for everything. And it's not because people don't want to be in these fields. It's because people don't pay enough. And then you've got the people who've been working in the fields for a long time, the older ones. And they said, how dare you only do this for the money? How else do you expect me to eat? <laughs> like, it's, I think the difference between them is how much they had to pay and what their starting salary rate is. Like the differential between that 
they were at least in a net positive from my understanding, or at least yeah. a net neutral. Whereas for ours, it's always been a net negative, and that disparity just keeps on getting higher and higher. Exactly. Oh, exactly. my goodness. It's like when people say, oh, we're a family. And I'm like, what sort of dysfunctional family are we a part of? <laughs> Very dysfunctional. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> A little pay raise would help so that I could actually pay for my grocery bills. And they're like, nah, no, thank you. Oh, we're going to give you pizza. Yeah, the pizza party stuff. <laughs> I appreciate a free food moment. However, oh, I think some, I yeah. Appreciate a bonus a lot more. Seriously, though. And then the issue, too, is whenever I remember there's this meme that was going around where there's this one place for their party. Instead of doing the pizza party, they gave them coupons, but it was expired coupons like from a year ago. Oh, no. So my thought process is when y'all got those coupons, why didn't you share it when you had them so that they didn't go expire? Like, why are they a year expired and you're now giving it out? I'm just like, that's messed up in my opinion. So messed up. Oh, my gosh. It's the reality that we're facing. That is true. Uh, but we're trying to change it. <laughs> little by little, day by day, mm -hmm. year by year. All right. So Shannon, if you were to share one piece of advice to yourself when you first started your like career or your journey and another with a stubborn person of color who has diabetes for a couple of years, what would the piece of advice be for each of them? I think so. My piece of advice to a stubborn person of color um, who has diabetes, I think I would tell them it can get better with a little bit of elbow grease and effort. But also, you don't have to give up your cultural foods. And I guess that's more of a piece of encouragement rather than advice. Yes, you may have to invest some money or time or both to find somebody help you how to figure out including your cultural foods in your diet, but it can be done. Mm -hmm. It can be done. And I think that's where just a lot of people get stuck, especially people of color, especially for those that still cook their traditional foods and their cultural foods. They're like, they're going to tell me that this is bad for me anyway. And it really just trying to drive home. It's not bad for you. Let's just figure this out. But they've been so, some of them have been so jaded by that point. So it's really mm -hmm. hard to get them to understand once, once it clicks. But that is one thing I would say, like, it gets better and you can have your favorite foods. Mm -hmm. you have to care. I think <laughs> piece of advice to myself wow piece of advice to myself starting my career wow that's another really <laughs> kind of stumped me piece of advice that I would give to myself really just stay the course don't get so involved in what's in front of you good or bad Things evolve over time. Things change. Things can change. And I've seen it change for myself. Like when I was at my outpatient job and we were all making under $53,000 a year, we would have conversations complaining very often about the pay and trying to get raises and things like that. And from that outlook, very seemingly no light at the end of the tunnels, like how am I ever going to make any more money. Not to say, oh, it's all about money, but again, inflation is brutal out here. And just cost of living is brutal. It's something that we do have to consider. It gets better. Like when I made the shift from outpatient to renal dialysis, you know, now I do, I would have to say that I have pretty good negotiation skills, but I was able to get myself maybe like a 15% increase. I was at leaving my outpatient job. And a dietitian starting out that may not have all the information or may not have seen other people reach those heights, they may think, okay, 50K, this is it. Or 60K after 20 years, that that's it. it. It does get better. I keep having to remind myself that nutrition is a very broad field. And I think also a piece of advice I would have given myself at the beginning of my career, don't feel tied down to one job, to one niche to one path. I know saying that now as somebody who's trying to establish myself more in the diabetes field may not ring so true all the time, but I still have other interests in like informatics and like the tech side of things. 
I would love to combine like software engineering with diabetes management. There's a lot of diabetes tech startups, a lot of diabetes software. Diabetes technology is a very emerging field. I could wake up tomorrow and be like, okay, how can I pivot into mm -hmm. this? I think I also would have told myself like, you don't have to work a clinical job as much as I love clinical, but a lot of us have it ingrained. Okay. We need to start off working in a hospital or working in an outpatient clinic, and then I can pivot to what I need to do. Not necessarily. To be fair, you did need a year of clinical to be a renal dietitian, but that's one of the only things that really has like a prerequisite. Mm -hmm. uh, now, do I regret it? No, because working in the long-term acute care with um, working in nutrition support, like two feedings and the IV feedings, as well as working in an outpatient setting with not just obesity and diabetes, but also people with GI issues, malnutrition, things like that. I was able to see everything. That was a really good um, way for me to see what all was out there in terms of like chronic diseases and different disease states and like a good turning point, so to speak. Like I really could have went any route with mm -hmm. that. So it definitely has its pros and cons. I, I, I coach other dietitians to be and younger dietitians. Don't feel tied down. If after a couple years or even after a year or a few months, if you, if the vibes aren't right, and I know people make fun of that sentiment, but if the vibes aren't right, Find somewhere else. If it's not jobs immaculate, got to look somewhere else. <laughs> exactly. Like, jobs are not loyal to you. So there's no reason for you to be just honed down with one area or one job. Like it's go explore. Nutrition mm -hmm. is a very broad field and it is our right to explore those different fields and to work in different settings. And to me, that just makes you a more versatile team player. Mm -hmm. at the end of the day because you've seen more you've done more you've worked with all different personality types you've worked under different types of leaders you've worked as different type of leader in different settings I just think it's a lot more lucrative to just have all these different experiences under your belt rather than just staying in one niche the whole time because you feel like you have to for the sake of I don't know looking good on, on your resume. I don't know. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, such a fountain of information. <laughs> Be focused on figuring out, okay, what do I want and go from there. And then also being okay with taking chances instead of staying focused on one small area to even helping people who are stubborn with diabetes to know that, Hey, focus on these other aspects that the information that is being fed out there it's similar to the field of nutrition that it's so vast. It's not just a one size fits all situation that there are other options that are out there. It's figuring out how can we have the balance that comes with it. Right. Yeah. Oh, so good. Okay. A few more other questions and then we'll be getting there. So what would you say has been the most rewarding experience when getting involved with uh, DI initiatives or working with people from underrepresented backgrounds? Yeah, I think the most rewarding experience really has been meeting my my colleagues, the ones that I mentioned earlier from across the country, making those friendships, and then also just encouraging the people coming up if they had a problem or if they felt like the outlook on the profession or their career as a dietitian was dim because they weren't a white middle-class person that could afford the internship and things like that, like providing those resources to say, hey, it may be a little bit more difficult, but this can be done. And really just seeing them stay the course and seeing them not exit the field as a result of your advice or your encouragement. Yeah. Awesome. Stick to the course. <laughs> things are yeah. going to get better. <laughs> That's like the theme, <laughs> really the yep. theme. Is the thing. Just stick to the course. Yep. Mm-hmm. All right, time for a few fun questions now. So what would you say has is your is zombie apocalypse survival plan? Wow. <laughs> I don't think I've ever thought of this. <laughs> okay, so I want a lot of snacks. Mm -hmm. A lot of snacks, a flashlight. I don't know. Probably get a bat. I don't know. Like, I'm yeah, <laughs> 
if I honestly, I'm probably just gonna run. <laughs> I just need to make sure that I can run with my snacks on me. Yep. Uh huh. Because I'm too scary to even try to fight back or say, oh. <laughs> Even, even when you play the video games and like the zombies come on the video games, I'm like, ah, yeah, like yeah. I'm even scared of them. Like, what's going on? <laughs> yeah, so I would probably run. I just need to make sure I have a backpack, I got some snacks, some Kool Aid or something. Mm-hmm. I'll get a lot of water because I'll probably be running for a while. Yep. Uh huh. <laughs> I don't know where I'm going to run to because, again, this plan is not, maybe I need to start drafting one. <laughs> There's your initiative for it. <laughs> Speaking of which, what would you say is like your ideal like full course meal then? So if you could have a thing for appetizer, main course, beverage of choice, dessert, side dishes, snacks in there, what would be your plethora of everything? <laughs> your <Well>, cornucopia. <laughs> I love any kind of dip. So either some kind of cheese dip or like a spinach and artichoke dip. Mm-hmm. like a I don't know like a hybrid bean and cheese dip I don't know some type of dip with chips being from Texas that very appropriate I mean, uh-huh. all- oh yeah <laughs> I'm here and I really love cheese so probably yeah like a spinach and artichoke dip plus a queso because I love queso but then doing like a cheese board also and then I'm obsessed with Caesar salads like I Everywhere I go, I try to eat a Caesar salad. Yep. And then I really love steak. Like, I love a good ribeye steak. That, very good. Dessert, chocolate cake or a cheesecake. And then all of this paired with, like, multiple glasses of wine. Different yep. to go with these. A sampler. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like a wine sampler. Yeah, but yeah, anytime, like, I want a really good meal, I go to a steakhouse. So. Mm-hmm. All right. Those what would you like rate the best steakhouse then oh that is a hard question i ask the good questions around here <laughs> there's this place that i worked at in galveston called number 13 mm-hmm. steakhouse they had a dry aging room mm-hmm. so dry aged their steaks in-house oh. and the dry aged steak has a very unique flavor to it mm-hmm. so i and, so to make up for that at other steakhouses, I asked for um, blue cheese on top of my steak because mm-hmm. um, the dry shake does have like a blue cheese funk to it. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, any anywhere where they serve dry aged steaks really is my favorite. Mm-hmm. I did Fleming's a lot when I went. I think I've been there a couple of times. I haven't tried Steak 48 yet and I've been wanting to go. So I see that in my near future. But yeah. Number 13 really has my heart, partially because like I helped open it because I did work there. Mm. That's where I learned a lot about wine. I learned a lot about steak. Like that's mm. really where I got the taste for those things from. Mm-hmm. Because we went through weeks of training, preparing for the opening of this restaurant. Yeah. And we had a in-house sommelier as well. Oh. Yeah. Okay. And no idea what that is, but that sounds awesome. Sommelier, the wine experts that. Oh, okay. And so he wasn't at the master level yet, but I think he was like currently studying to become a master sommelier. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. So I learned a lot during that time. And that's where I got a taste for a lot of those things. And it, they just really stuck with me. They never left me. So yeah, I really appreciate that place. But yeah, I love a good night at Fleming's as well. Add that to my bucket list of places to go to. When I make a trip to Texas. <laughs> yes. Oh, goodness. All right, Shannon, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. I'm sure the audience who has been listening to this, who's been watching this, they really felt your message. And now they're very curious of how can we connect with the amazing Shannon? <laughs> yes, yes. So I am on Instagram, diabetes.fitness.rd. And I will give you that information as well so they can click on it easily. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, that's my main platform right now. And I do some posting. Just I really like to promote the non-restrictive lifestyle that you can have when you work with a coach that helps you eat the foods that you want while also pursuing your health goals. That's mm-hmm. me. Follow me and shoot me a DM if you want to chat. But that's where you can find me. Awesome. I'm sure your inbox is going to gonna get flooded once more of this gets taken off. (laughs) 
Yes, I'm excited for everyone to listen. Shout out to all of my friends because my my close friends, they come through in a clutch anytime I do something. So they will be flooding your podcast. Uh, <laughs> so for sure. I would love that. <laughs> all right. Thank you all so much for tuning in. And of course, do one small thing that can improve your health for today and tomorrow and just keep building on that. Whether that's an extra sip of water, taking one extra step, spending a minute of some breathing exercises, whatever that be, make it sustainable and your health will flourish. <laughs> all right. We'll see y'all in the next episode.